The New Orleans Saints lose running back Latavius Murray to the Denver Broncos, and while it's not their fault, they are still stuck picking up the pieces at the position. How will they do that? we got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdet Nation and Houdet family? Welcome into another episode of Locked On Saints, your daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Saints, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much, as always. Make it Locked On Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget that we're free and available on all podcast apps and on YouTube as well. And I'm your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter, your New Orleans Saints expert, credential member of the media, CrescentCitySports.com, USA Today, Saints Wire, Tuesdays in Locked On NFL, and here with you every single Monday through Friday. On Locked on Saints. On today's episode, we're a quarter way through the season, kind of, right? Technically, it's a 17-game season now. But through four weeks, what have we learned about the New Orleans Saints? I'll give you 10 takeaways to wrap up today's show. We're also going to take a look at why the pass rush has become a bit of a silver lining for the New Orleans Saints, how they've gotten that done. But first, the Saints lose out on uh, maintaining running back Latavius Murray this week. He ends up getting signed off of their practice squad to the Denver Broncos active roster. But the Saints basically did everything that they could do to keep Latavius Murray in the building after his 11 rush for 57 yards and a touchdown performance in London against the Minnesota Vikings. So let's break down how this happened, uh, what it means for the New Orleans Saints, why it's not their fault, and or not necessarily and, but more so, but (laughs) why they're still stuck picking up the pieces here and where they go next at the position. So here's how this all happened. Um, Latavius Murray was a practice squad elevation, a standard game day elevation from their practice squad going into Sunday's game against the Minnesota Vikings in London. Every week, every team across the NFL is allowed to elevate for the game, right? For those four quarters, uh, two players from their practice squad up to their active game day roster. The other alternative is to move a player from your practice squad to the active roster so that they become a part of the 53-man count and then would stay on the active roster moving forward. You'd have to cut them. The players that you bring up as standard game day elevations revert to the practice squad after the game. And then basically there's a period over the course of Monday that that player can get signed to other teams' active rosters or the same team's active roster. For instance, uh, you know, a team might have Latavius Murray come up on Sunday, have that 57-yard performance with the, with the, with the touchdown, uh, continuously moving the chains, doing all the good things that Latavius Murray did in that game. And then the Saints could have signed him on Monday to a contract, but they didn't. But that's not necessarily their fault because Latavius Murray gets his pick. He gets to say whether or not he wants to accept that contract and be on the active roster, all of that. So it's not as simple as, hey, you're on the active roster now, you don't have a choice. That player can also receive um, you could also receive contract offers from other teams. And I've seen some folks ask about protections. There are mechanisms in place where you can protect up to four players on your practice squad as an NFL team. The issue is that those protections don't kick in until Tuesday. So between the game and Tuesday, you're able to be signed to another team's roster. You basically have a day. That's a good thing that the NFLPA negotiated within the protections policy that make it so that a player can go out there, have a good performance, and not be beholden to a team's practice squad, can still go out there and receive another opportunity. That was part of the contract negotiations, all of that stuff. The Saints, according to Nick Underhill over at NewOrleans.Football, did offer Latavius Murray a contract after his performance on Sunday in London. The issue is that at the same sort of situation here, Latavius Murray and his representation wisely waited to see if any other offers were going to come about. And once the Denver Broncos had their injury, the season-ending ACL-LCL injury to star running back Javante Williams, they ended up offering Latavius Murray a contract to go to Denver. And Latavius Murray wisely, as well as his reputation, wisely accepted that contract. It's just a greater opportunity for Uh, Latavius Murray in Denver than he would have received in New Orleans. You look at what the New Orleans Saints would have had to offer there, and you're talking about getting Latavius Murray, uh, you know, a part of a rotation with Alvin Kamara and Mark Ingram. So he would have been the second or third running back in a three running back rotation behind uh, Alvin Kamara. 
he wouldn't have been the you know solid number two, and he certainly wouldn't be getting the same opportunity that he's getting in Denver right now, which is to effectively be their running back number one because behind uh, Javante Williams, you've got a guy who's fumbled the ball four times already this season. So Latavius Murray should get a larger opportunity in Denver, and I hope that it all works out for him. Latavius Murray is a great dude. It was cool cool to see him back in New Orleans. Cool to see him back on the team. Um, on the field for the team going up against his former team, the Minnesota Vikings in London. Great story, but now he's got a bigger and better opportunity over in Denver. So that's why it's not the New Orleans Saints' fault. There's not really a lot that they could have done here aside from maybe proactively adding him to the active roster, but there was no reason for them to do that going into Sunday's game, especially when they were dealing with injuries at the quarterback position and had to let go of somebody from their backfield, Adam Prentice, in order to get another quarterback back up on the roster in case they dealt with injuries to Andy Dalton and Taysom Hill. So what do the Saints do now at running back? Are they in a situation where they need to go out and find another running back? Not necessarily. Depending upon how quickly uh, Alvin Kamara is back, you can continue to move forward with Alvin Kamara and with uh, Mark Ingram, of course. Mark Ingram had a very similar day just a couple of weeks ago against a much better run defense in the Tampa Bay Buccaneers where he ran over 10 times for 58 yards. Now, the difference is that he had a fumble and a turnover and Latavius Murray didn't. He actually had a touchdown. So you need to turn those fumbles, you know, maintain all of that. But we've seen that from Mark Ingram over and over again to where he has some fumbles early on in the year, but the Saints stick with him. They show them, you show him the confidence and then he ends up being an asset for them. Now, the other issue is that he's a little bit older at this point, but Latavius Murray was also, you know, not far off in age from Mark Ingram. So you might still want to go out there and look for another running back, but who are you really going to call at this point, aside from maybe David Johnson, who the Saints visited with in the training camp uh, portion of the season, but didn't arrive at a contract uh, agreement. Now, that might have been more about David Johnson not getting an offer that he liked, maybe something about the New Orleans Saints, but what they didn't like about um, what they didn't like about David Johnson. So there are other players that are still out there that they could potentially lean on and they could, could potentially call up if they decide that they want to go that route. So the opportunity is there for them. They'll just sort of need to figure out exactly where um, or, or if they need to dip into that free agent running back pool. If Alvin Kamara is back and healthy with you as early as this weekend and gets the Seattle Seahawks, who he has consistently had a lot of success against, then you don't necessarily need it. You roll forward with Alvin Kamara and Mark Ingram and um, probably Dwayne Washington because you want the special teams guy, but you also have Tony Jones Jr. that's available there. He's been inactive the last couple of weeks, and then you're in a fine place at running back. So not really something to put on the Saints. There are a lot of things to be upset about when it comes to the Saints' disappointing start. Latavius Murray taking the better, de- making the good decision and taking the better opportunity in Denver, not necessarily one of them. The Saints are going to be fine at this position, just stinks because you watch Latavius Murray have a really, really good game very, very recently. I would have loved to have seen them and Murray build on that momentum, but just not the case. Hopefully, though, he'll be able to build on that momentum for himself in Denver. Coming up next, the New Orleans Saints have built on some momentum when it comes to the pass rush. It's become a bit of a silver lining. What's changed and what's going right for the New Orleans Saints pressure packages? I'll break all that down as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Before we get to that, I want to tell you about our friends over at Athletic Greens because they are creating a product that I use every single day. It's their AG1 powder, which gives you over 75 really necessary vitamins and minerals in one glass of water, basically, without you having to take a bunch of multivitamins and chewable vitamins and all these other things. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. It's all in one scoop, one eight-ounce cup of water, or bottle of water, shake it up, take it with you, drink it before you have your morning coffee, and then bam, you're all set, you're all done. I usually keep it next to some of my like colder coffee fixings because I keep it in the refrigerator, and so my creamer, things like that, keep it right next to that so that I always remember, oh, do this first, and then you can have your coffee. So if you want to check it out, it's awesome. Uh, it helps you out with a whole bunch of stuff, including staying focused, which y'all know is a big issue for me, um, with gut health, with digestive health, all of that. So if you want to check them out, they make it really, really easy for you. All that you have to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash NFL network. And what they're going to do is make sure you get a free one year supply of their immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs on your first purchase. Once again, all you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NFL network. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash NFL network to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. 
All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Thanks again for making us your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget to also go and check out our NFL Key Prediction Show over at Locked on NFL, giving you everything you need to know from the local experts, breaking down all of the biggest matchups of the week, including all of the betting advice that you need from the online uh, betting leaders and our friends over at Bet Online. So check it out wherever you get your podcasts every Friday uh, over at the Locked On NFL YouTube feed and on uh, or, or on podcasts and YouTube as well. I appreciate you as always for being here for another episode. Uh, the next thing I want to discuss here on today's show is uh, the New Orleans Saints pass rush. So through the first two games of the season, up against Marcus Mariota and up against Tom Brady, the Saints totaled one sack in those two games. In the two games since then, going up against the Carolina Panthers and Baker Mayfield, their starting quarterback, and in this past weekend going up against Kirk Cousins and the Minnesota Vikings, the Saints have compiled six sacks in those two games. So what's changed? What's gone better for this New Orleans Saints defense? The first thing that I will say is that this is a good sign. This is sort of the silver lining or one of the silver linings that, uh, of many that the Saints defense is providing. Pete Werner is one of those. Uh, Tyron Matthew, you know, starting to create these takeaways. He is one of those. Demario Davis continues to be one of those silver linings. Getting Paulson Adebo back to silver lining. All of that. Those are all good things for the New Orleans Saints defense. Now you're starting to see the pass rush start to come together. And that's an even bigger silver lining because we know the New Orleans Saints find a lot of success in their pass rush over the defensive side. Since Ryan Nielsen has been in the building since 2017, the Saints have never finished a 16-game stretch for any season, even the 17-game season last year, without totaling over 40 sacks. Now, right now, they're on pace, if they keep at this pace, to finish with less than 30 before the season is out. So we'll need to see this continue to pick up. You're going to need to see some four-sack, five-sack, six-sack games. But based on what we have seen over the course of the past couple of weeks, there's a good chance that you start to see that happening as the season continues to roll along. So what changed? What happened in the most recent two games versus the first two games that allowed the Saints to be able to start to build momentum in this area of the game? The first thing that we should acknowledge is the difference in quarterback styles that they played already this season. Marcus Mariota, who Cam Jordan describes as a running back who can throw, is a mobile quarterback, which means that you don't really, as a defensive line, start to pin your ears back and try to get sacks there. You try to contain that guy. You try to keep him from getting outside the pocket, extending plays, scrambling, all of that. Now, he still scrambled for over 70 yards, which the Saints defensive line said, hey, that was too much, but their their goal was all the same. And remember, they also forced a turnover uh, in, in one of his scrambling situations as well. So for the Saints, in that week one game, Getting sacks on Marcus Mariota, as weird as it sounds, wasn't really the goal. The goal against a mobile quarterback is don't let him run all over you. Don't let Jalen Hurts be Jalen Hurts. And the way that you do that is by not overpressuring and making sure that you're remaining disciplined in terms of containing him within the pocket, forcing him to throw the ball. The second quarterback that they took on was Tom Brady. Now, the Saints have totaled at least three sacks at each of the previous four regular season meetings against Tom Brady. Three sacks, three sacks, four sacks, three sacks in that order over their 2020-2021 matchups. This past season, in the Week 2 matchup, only one sack. Why is that the case? Tom Brady's not a very mobile quarterback. He's not somebody that you're focused on containing, anything like that. But Tom Brady is also somebody that you don't blitz, right? You're not going to send extra pressure from the second level on Tom Brady because then he's just going to start to pick apart all of the open parts of of the the zone coverage that's that's left behind. So, you end up seeing instead a game plan that is trying to get pressure with the front four. But when it comes to Tom Brady, you're getting the ball out really, really quickly as one of the quickest releases in the NFL. So with that in mind, it becomes a bit challenging to get that pressure on Tom Brady. So that is something that the Saints struggled with in week two. It's not to say that it's excusable. It's just simply something that was a factor in that game. So those are two very specific quarterback styles that the Saints didn't pursue or didn't create enough pursuit to be able to get the rack up the sack numbers on you look at their last two opponents uh baker mayfield and Kirk cousins neither of these guys are burners on the ground neither of these guys are scramblers and also neither of these guys are nearly as equipped to get the ball out as quickly although Kirk cousins and the minnesota vikings started their game that way as tom brady so for the saints this presented a much more favorable matchup when it came to getting in the backfield and getting sacks. 
They did that well against Baker Mayfield. They did it well again against Kirk Cousins. The other thing that worked in both of these is that they were able to blitz a little bit. So you got the additional pressure from the second level. You certainly saw that in this in the uh, most recent game against Kirk Cousins and the Minnesota Vikings, where Pete Werner was consistently in the backfield on on, on his few pass rushing downs. Um, uh, 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 Demario Davis, I believe he was one of four uh, in terms of a pass rushing snap and getting pressure. And of course, he ended up getting a sack on that. So his sack percentage was like 45. I mean, it was like 25 percent in that case. So he was very effective there. But you also saw the Saints win a lot on the edge. The Saints in total piled on, according to Pro Football Focus, 15 different pressures, some of those being on the same play uh, against Kirk Cousins. Cam Jordan, Marcus Davenport accounted for 10 of those 15 pressures. They won on the edge consistently. Cam Jordan's win percentage, 18.8% in this game. Usually around a 20% win percentage is like really, really good. 15% win percentage in a game is also good. So Cam Jordan was up there big time playing like a man possessed in that game. Now, they were going up against a less talented offensive line, but an offensive line that is probably kind of like par for the course across the NFL by the time you get into the middle of the season and you're going up against like injured offensive lines and things like that. Think back to the Monday night football game last week, last night when it came to the San Francisco 49ers as well as the um the Los Angeles Rams who were all dealing with interior offensive line shifts and new tackles. Uh, so pretty, pretty big stuff going on all across the NFL when it comes to offensive line units. So to say that the Saints benefited from going up against a uh, average offensive line is, 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 is fine, but also acknowledge that most offensive lines around the NFL aren't, the, the gap isn't that far, right? So this is good news for the New Orleans Saints, especially knowing that you're getting that much pressure from the edge, you're effectively then committing to the idea that, hey, the Saints can get pressure with their front four in these games. Contavia Street getting in there as well. You saw some good pressure from David Onyemata as well. So, you know, seeing or good plays from David Onyemata. So seeing all of that come from the front four is uh, pretty important for this New Orleans Saints defensive line. So you're able to create that pressure for some errant throws, even if you're not able to get home. And then that gives you opportunities to be able to pick up more interceptions, pick up more turnovers, which is something that the New Orleans Saints desperately need as they're at a minus seven turnover differential right now with 11 giveaways versus only four takeaways, having just got their first interception of the season last weekend against the Minnesota Vikings in week four. Now that they are through those four weeks, we've learned a lot about the New Orleans Saints. So I'm going to give you 10 takeaways through the first quarter of the season or technically the first quarter of the season that you need to know going into week five. Got that coming up for you as we continue on to wrap up today's episode of Locked Up Saints. But before we get to that, I want to tell you about our friends over at Bet Online, your number one source for all of your sports betting needs, sports wagering needs, uh, odds, news, scores, uh, podcast, articles, everything that you can imagine Bet Online has for you. And that's just the content. The betting stuff is even more in-depth because you want to bet on esports, you want to bet on combat sports, you want to bet on golf. NASCAR, uh, auto sports, all of that. They have everything you can imagine, including, of course, the NFL. They have the New Orleans Saints right now favored as they return home to the States next weekend, again, or this coming weekend, against the Seattle Seahawks. Minus six point favorites in this one. So minus six is the spread in favor of the New Orleans Saints hosting those Seattle Seahawks. So can the New Orleans Saints bounce back and get back to uh, you know, a respectable two and three going into a much tougher stretch of the season? They'd certainly love to see it. And it seems like Vegas and Bet Online thinks that they can get it done. If you think so, or if you don't think so, you can go ahead and head over to Bet Online and get in on the action right away. It's going to Bet Online today. They are our exclusive online uh, sports wagering partners here at the Locked On Podcast Network. Once again, it's Bet Online where the game starts. Let's get it. Huda Nation, wrap it up today's episode of Locked On Saints with 10 takeaways through the first four weeks of the season. So we're going to get straight to the takeaways here, give a little bit of context, but mostly I just want you to know what you should be taking away, what you should learn from the first four games of the New Orleans Saints season. Usually when it was a 16 game season, we would call this the first quarter of the season. So we'd look back at the first quarter. Now you have a 17th game, all of that stuff, but still we've seen enough now to kind of know what to start to expect or know or learn about this team. So let's start off with takeaway number one here, which is simple. Turnovers are hard to overcome. And the Saints just keep shooting themselves in the foot when it comes to them. The Saints right now minus seven when it comes to their turnover differential, giving the ball away 11 times, taking the ball away only four times, as we just mentioned, just got their first interception of the season 
Thanks to Tyron Matthew and thanks to Kirk Cousins, honestly. Uh, but Tyron Matthew, great read on that pass, taking over the, the cover two hole there. But this is a team that just recently set a record for the fewest turnovers in a season. Now they're on pace to lead the NFL or, or excuse me, to be at the bottom of the NFL when it comes to turnover differential. So they'll need to kind of right that ship pretty quickly. Um, if they want to right the ship, then takeaway two here is important. Veteran leadership uh, keeps bringing confidence to this team despite their early struggles. Tyron Matthew, Cam Jordan, Demario Davis, you have some of the best leaders in terms of player personnel in the league on this team in this locker room. So the thing you don't necessarily have to worry about is despite the Rocky start at one and three, this locker room losing itself or the team losing the locker room. I just don't see that happening, especially with the leadership that they have. And that's good news because if you want a team that's going to be able to turn it around, it starts with the attitude. And right now the Saints attitude is very confident and they're, they feel they're very close. We'll have to see it to believe it on the field, right? But it starts with the mentality and the Saints definitely have the mentality. Uh, Dennis Allen's slow start is pretty undeniable here. One in three, you're looking at other, you know, first year coaches with their teams, Brian Dable, Arthur Smith, they're, you know, tied at the top or sitting at the top or very near the top of their divisions with less talented rosters than what the New Orleans Saints have. So there's a lot still here that, you know, the, the, the Dennis Allen sort of debate is, is far from uh, concluded or far from informed enough to even be close to included. But as of right now, it's undeniable that this slow start is a disappointing one considering them betting on continuity, them betting on maintaining the structure uh, and failing so far here to open up the season despite all of the talent that they have on the roster. But we'll see. You know, they all believe that they're close to turning it around. Dennis Allen, not an exception to that. Chris Olave is set up to be a star in the NFL. 335 receiving yards already on the season leads the team. And if you look at the tape, there are some opportunities there for him to potentially even put, uh, have more on, on top of all of that. So he's been absolutely outstanding, and he hasn't just been that one-dimensional threat that a lot of people thought that he might be as a downfield guy. He's been a three-level threat for the New Orleans Saints, exactly as we expected. Outstanding route runner uh, and just the consummate professional, just a guy that is very, very, very veteran savvy mindset, even though he is a rookie. He's got a lot of good stuff ahead of him, and the Saints expect a lot from him. Uh, special teams just isn't the same in New Orleans. Uh, pick, take your pick, right? Uh, coverage, not as great so far this season, although punt coverage struggled last year as well. Uh, we also have the um, you know, uh, the field goals, right? You have one missed field goal in each of the last four games, so one, one missed field goal in each game so far this season, that which we give a little bit of grace to the last one, right? It was a 61-yard field goal. He had just nailed a 60-yarder. But still, you know, it's not necessarily what you expected with getting back a healthy Will Lutz. Uh, and then you're not seeing the, the same execution in the return game either. So special teams just not the same for New Orleans, who have a really good defense, but if special teams and offense can't keep everything together, the Saints are going to be in a bad situation here, even with their, uh, even with their outstanding defense. Um, the Saints made the right decision when it came to Pete Werner. That's takeaway number five today. I know there were a lot of people clamoring around the idea of getting Quan Alexander back, and I think rightfully so as, at, at a certain point in the offseason because things kind of got, I'll say, magnified a bit when the team was dealing with injuries at the position and everything as well, but it's very clear that the Saints made the right decision uh, when it came to Pete Werner and keeping him in New Orleans, giving him uh, that shot, right, a, a larger shot within the NFL. Uh, sorry, I think that was actually takeaway number six. My apologies, I forgot to keep counting. Takeaway number seven, uh, penalties have got to get cleaned up for the New Orleans Saints, and I know that there's some penalties that you can't really clean up. I mean, like, you know, bad hands to the face penalties, bad pass interference penalties, you have to know that those are going to come, but you can't really do much about them. False start penalties, uh, illegal shifts, illegal man downfield holding penalties. Those are things that have to get cleaned up, especially over on the offensive side where the Saints have had a lot of trouble with stagnating their own downs or their own drives by committing those penalties and going backwards. So those are the things that really need to get cleaned up for New Orleans. Uh, getting the run game going does have its benefits, doesn't it? So this is takeaway number eight here. You look at the uh, Minnesota Vikings game, the New Orleans Saints ran nine times for 51 yards in the fourth quarter. That far exceeds the first three games combined where they ran only, oh, sorry, in the fourth quarter. Uh, so let me, let, me, let me say that again. They ran the ball nine times for 51 yards in the fourth quarter against the Minnesota Vikings. That far exceeds their total over the first three games combined of only two rushes for seven yards. Now, a lot of this has to do with game situation, field possession, time, uh, as well as, of course, scoring deficit, all of that. Saints didn't run once in the fourth quarter against the Atlanta Falcons, and it makes perfect sense why, right? First of all, the passing game got to clicking, started working, 
but also you're you know playing from behind uh, big time there. Takeaway number nine, hard to argue in favor of a quarterback controversy here. Um, you know, outside of the one 12 yard possession in the first half, Andy Dalton didn't have the greatest first half with the New Orleans Saints offense, several three and outs. They lead the NFL in three and outs right now, all of that. So I think you need to see another game of Andy Dalton if Jameis Winston isn't healthy. But if Jameis Winston is healthy, expect the Saints to continue to ride with their starting quarterback. And then finally, um, the injuries just aren't getting much better. Uh, I, I will say that you can make the argument that the soft tissue injuries have gotten better, but when you have a team that is missing so many key pieces, Michael Thomas, Marcus May, Alvin Kamara, Andrus Pete, uh, all of these players that they were missing, Paulson Adebo early on in the season, it's just kind of piling up already. And so even if the soft tissue injuries are coming down and it's the impact injuries that are having a factor, this is still something the New Orleans Saints are supposed to kind of you know, take steps toward improving uh, here. And there's only so much you can do in the game of football. I get it. But yo, at some point, you just have to say, when is this going to stop? Or when is this going to get better? And as of right now, we're not seeing it get any better, although we expected it to. Still much time left in the season, but those are 10 things we've learned so far about the New Orleans Saints through four weeks. Uh, Coming up tomorrow, it's Wednesday. So we're going to get into our Film Watch Wednesday. We'll break down a little bit of what happened between Justin Jefferson and Marshall and Lattimore. That's going to be our big focus, as well as, of course, keeping you up to date with all the things you need to know around your New Orleans Saints in less than 30 minutes every single Monday through Friday. Thanks so much, as always, making us your first listen of the day. For your second listen, make sure you go and check out the Peacock and Williamson NFL show, all of your NFL analysis that you need across the entire league in less than 30 minutes as well, available on the Locked on NFL YouTube page or on the Peacock and Williamson podcast feed, wherever you get your podcast. Appreciate you as always making me a part of your day, part of your routine for saying yes to me and the show. As always, if you see me, say hi. If you need anything else around your New Orleans Saints, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you're mom and them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.